It's a pleasure to be with you for this uh, event. I hope to inform, educate, entertain, galvanize, and infuriate as many people as uh, possible through this uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, the key, the, the title of this event is The Accountant's Odyssey, How Do We Shape the Future? Well, we shape, shape the future by attending to the issues that are current and also reflecting on the past because the future is always born from the present and the past. A lot of people at the moment are immersed on uh, or, or focused on issues about new technologies, which is very, very important. But of course, technology itself does not solve uh, many of our problems. It may actually create more, and accountants need to be ready to deal with those uh, challenges. So what I'm going to do is reflect on how we shape the future and what accountants can or can't do by looking at a major scandal which has engulfed the UK for the time being, and that is the post office uh, scandal. So I will go through that and along the way and also at the end flag up some of the issues. So the post office limited, that is the proper name of the entity, is actually a public corporation and the Department of Business and Trade is its sole shareholder. The business secretary appoints the chairman and the board of directors and uh, they then elect a chief uh, executive. That is essentially the corporate structure. Now, of course, the post office was persuaded, like every other organization, to cut costs and also to tackle what they thought was fraud uh, by introducing a new computer system. That computer system was designed by Fujitsu, and uh, the trials began in 1999, and this, okay, this system was going to help with accounting and stock taking at, a net, at its network of branches. Th there's a huge sh scale of this kind of a project, just to give you some numbers. Uh, for this project, the Horizon system, uh, some 20,000 offices across the country were affected. Then they needed to connect 40,000 new computers to that system, 67,000 people would have been trained to handle trillions, billions, trillions of transactions, at the very least paying 56 billion pound in benefits to 28 million customers. So you can see the sheer huge scale. And what that means, like everybody else knows, that before a system goes live, you test it, Often you run it in parallel with the older system to see that it delivers acceptable results. And you don't actually switch to the new system until you are satisfied that everything is working properly. Well, that uh, did not quite go to plan, or at least some people thought that the system was working, but perhaps it had fundamental flaws. So the Horizon system was a custom spec computer system operating on Microsoft Windows, and the computers would sit under, the system would sit under every counter, and each system, essentially a computer, had a keyboard connected to it, a barcode scanner, and a receipt printer together with a touch screen. So that is basically the system which the sub-postmasters came across. So every night, all the information collected from the branch would be uploaded to the central post office mainframe computer. So uh, that is what they had to do. And uh, the system was favored by the post office because they thought this would uh, highlight fraud. And of course, if you're expecting the system to, system to highlight fraud, and then there are errors which highlight fraud, well, you assume that the system is operating correctly. You don't ask the question whether the fraud was there in the first place. Now you can see the, the problems, that when you're using technology, you are likely to believe that the technology is correct and it is the human beings who are fundamentally flawed. Now that, that is an issue which continues to this day with this system. Now the Horizon system was prone to errors and crashes. And... Uh, 
between 1999 and 2019, Jiu-Jitsu, who supplied the system, changed the Horizon software code, and I'll give you an exact number, 19,842 times. So that is how many patches were issued to patch up this fundamentally flawed system. That is about 1,000 changes a year were made. This is while the system is live and running, okay? So in April 2015, an internal report identified that there were also 12,000 communication failures. That is, the system not communicating with the central uh, computer. And uh, so you can see the huge scale of problems. And uh, there were many kind of odd things which continue to happen. To give you a couple of examples, a sub-postmaster tried to record a receipt of £8,000 and the computer screen simply froze. And what do we do when the screen freezes? We go mad, you, you hit the key again and again, you're thinking, well, that would unfreeze it. So this, uh, this sub-postmaster hit the enter key again and again. Every hit increased the re receipt. <laughs> and the system recorded that she had received an income of 32,000, which was actually not the case. The income of 8,000 suddenly became 32,000. And that is what she was expected to account for. There was another bug, which had a name, the reversal bug. So this involved an incorrect sign in the software code. So instead of the minor sign that it was supposed to be, it became somehow a plus sign. So this meant that on some occasions, reversing a transaction, that is cancelling it, had the opposite effect. So instead of cancelling the transaction, the system doubled it instead. And then the individuals who handled those entries uh, for the system were expected to make up the shortfall. Okay. So now just pause and ask yourself some questions about testing the system. How do you test the system? Why was this testing so deficient? Uh, what did the external auditors make of these tests? Did they see the logs? Did they ask the questions? What did the internal auditors do? Did they not examine the logs? Did they not report to the audit committee? So there are numerous questions which anyone with an accounting mind would ask. But nevertheless, there was this faith that this system provided by a giant multinational company, Fujitsu, was somehow okay. Well, it was obviously not okay. And uh, we all know that Fujitsu itself was able to change the transactions entered by the sub-postmasters. In other words, it was able to make remote changes. So the system was flawed. Audit committee didn't ask any question. Auditors perhaps knew. Directors certainly knew, but the order of silence uh, prevailed. All assumed that the system was flawless and any errors or financial deficiencies were the flaws, were the faults of uh, the sub-postmasters. So the, so the post office then decided that it had identified the fraud, which it was expecting to identify, and uh, it prosecuted. So between 1999 and 2015, some 3,500 3, postmasters were accused of theft, fraud, and, fa and false accounting. The postmasters in question were suspended without pay. Their homes were often raided to collect the evidence of the assumption that they had hidden away the cash. A number of the sub-postmasters under pressure made up the shortfalls from their own personal savings and by borrowing. So you know the feeling that when you're up against a bigger beast, you just submit, you give up, you're bludgeoned into submission. And that is exactly uh, what happened. So they simply owned up. So a couple of days ago, uh, uh, Monday, I met a sub-postmaster. He ran a sub-post office and there was a deficiency reported at his uh, post office. His mother ran a post office, and she also faced the same. So mother and son both coughed up money, which they never should have paid, because they were bludgeoned into uh, silence, and they were also prosecuted. So just in one family. 
So the exact number of the sub postmasters prosecuted is still not fully known, but at least 983 were wrongly convicted of fraud and the number received prison sentences. Four of these committed suicide. Now you can imagine, it is not just four people committing suicide. With them, their families are affected, friends are affected, and the pain simply goes on. So eventually in March 2017, with support of a no-win, no-fee law firm, some 555 sub-postmasters brought, uh, brought a group together and took a case to the High Court against the post office. In December 2019, the High Court produced a 300-page judgment in the case of Alan Bates and others versus Post Office Limited. With the information from uh, whistleblowers, insiders, and others, the judge could see the evidence that the Horizon system was full of bugs, errors, and defects, and the Post Office and Fujitsu knew that the system was defective. Since then, some criminal prosecutions have been overturned, but there is a lot more to yet come out. And the whole thing became popularized, caught public's attention, with the January 2024 ITV broadcast of Mr. Bates versus the Post Office, a drama which was based on the scandal. It resonated with people because in everyday life, we are up against corporations, whether they are cheating us or, or not dealing with us honestly and openly, whether it is banks, whether it is energy companies, whether it is rail companies, water companies and others. So this kind of a drama resonated with people for that reason. People feel that we are in it all together and this is really uh, the issue. So after the High Court judgment, an inquiry was launched in September 2020, headed by Sir Wynne Williams. That inquiry is yet to report. That inquiry subsequently became statutory. It is still taking evidence. There are also a number of other parliamentary committees examining the issues. So what do we know about corporate governance through this scandal? Well, we are always told that you should have a diverse board, you need non-executive directors, and all will be well. But was it? So between the year 2000 and 2023, Post Office had over 80, 80 directors, and all must have known that the Horizon system was flawed. But they all kept quiet. Keeping quiet meant that the monies fraudulently secured from sub-postmasters boosted the bottom line, because that was important, that was part of the performance-related pay. So performance-related pay has always been a problem. That's not just a problem here. It's a problem at rail companies, problem at water companies. And tomorrow I'm leading a debate in the House of Lords and the water companies, and I will be highlighting that. So that shows up here. Now, of course, government gives their subsidy to the post office, and the level of that subsidy depends on what surplus the post office generates. So if post office has collected millions from innocent sub-postmasters, that means the government subsidy uh, is also lower than what it should have been. Now, the post office had a number of non-executive directors who cheered, amongst other things, uh, who cheered, amongst other things, audit committees, risk committees, compliance committees, remuneration, and many other committees. The key role of non-executive directors is to challenge management, including the chief executive, on financial and operating issues. And the strategy which ought to be executed to achieve the company's objectives. Now, so far, there is little evidence to show that any of these chief executive, uh, any of these non-executive directors who are appointed by the main board ask any questions. Now, they should have asked questions because the prosecutions of sub postmasters received a lot of coverage. I first noted it in year 2009 uh, in, a, in a story uh, in, in Accountancy Age. And, of course, these matters have been reported ever since. So did the non-executive directors never notice that there were 
literally hundreds of prosecutions, thousands of prosecutions, that there was uh, negative press coverage, people were claiming innocence. Did they never notice that more than one person a week was being prosecuted? Did they never notice that the legal costs were rising? So poses a whole series of questions. So if you want to shape the future, you got to pay attention to details. And these people don't appear to her. The post office had an internal audit department which reported to audit committee. Now, what did the internal audit department do? Did it never notice any of the press clippings? Did it never notice that the Horizon system was fundamentally flawed? Or maybe it reported, but somebody sat on it. Again, lots of questions to be uh, asked. Did the external auditors know? The answer is yes. So, lots of documents have become publicly available through the Horizon Inquiry led by Sir Wynne Williams and also through Freedom of Information requests. So, here is the Ernst & Young, who I'll tell you more about in a moment, management letter to the Post Office Board. It is dated 27th March 2011. It's quite a long letter and I'll just read out uh, some bits. It says the outsourcing of post offices IT function to a, to a third party service provider in bracket Fujitsu creates a degree of complexity and difficulty for the post office in gaining assurance that they are adequate. So the third party, just to comment on that third party, Fujitsu is able to make remote changes to the system which are not necessarily known or approved by the company. And that obviously affects the integrity of eventual financial numbers and financial statements too. So that meant Ernst & Young knew that there were problems. And then Ernst & Young go on, we noted that post office are not usually involved in testing fixes. Remember I told you how many thousands of fixes there have been? So he said, we, we noted that post office are not usually involved in testing fixes or maintenance changes to the in-scope applications. We are unable to identify an internal control with a third-party service provider to authorize fixes and maintenance charges prior to development for the in-scope applications. That is an extract from a long letter dated 27th March 2011. On no occasion, any of these uncertainties been highlighted in the audit report or in the audit opinion. So, let's, so what was going on? So let's look at the auditors a little bit more. Under the Companies Act 2006, auditors have unhindered access to all files, documents, employees, officers to enable them to secure any information that they think they need to form an opinion on the financial statement. Ernst and Young were the external auditors of post office from 1986 to 2018, almost the entire period, well, the entire period of the scandal which is now being covered in the media. Section 386 of the Companies Act 2006 requires companies to, key, companies to quote, keep adequate accounting records and, quote, show and explain the company's transactions. So in view of the continuing problems of the Horizon system and the thousands of fixes, should there be a question mark whether the post office actually kept adequate accounting records or whether it received adequate uh, returns from various branches and offices? Ernst and Young did not really raise any concerns about this in their audit report. So the auditors, as part of their statutory duties, have to assess whether there are adequate accounting records. What did they do? So that position, that question really needs to be answered. Now, what else do we know? There is another internal report of the post office which has come out. Uh, and it is publicly available. It is dated 2nd August 2010. So remember, prosecution had begun sometime in 1999. 
the flow of prosecutions was very high between 2005 and 2010. So this report dated 2nd August 2010 and is headed Horizon Dash Responses to Challenges Regarding Systems Integrity. That is the title of the report. It is written by the Post Office Head of Product and Branch Accounting. And the person's name is Rob Ismay, who, strangely enough, is a former Ernst & Young man. And now he's head of the Product and Branch Accounting. On that report, pa pages 19 to 20 are very interesting. And I just read this to you. A extract from pages 19 and 20. So it, first extract, Ernst & Young at Deloitte's, that Deloitte's been hired in capacity, but not as auditors. So Ernst and Young and Deloitte's are both aware of the issue from the media, and we have discussed the pros and cons of reports with them. Both would propose significant caveats and would have limits on their ability to stand in court. So remember, at that time, lots of people are being prosecuted who claim innocence, but the post office is saying, no, the system is reliable, everything is okay, these people are the crooks. So it says both would propose significant caveats and would have limits on their ability to stand in court. There were, therefore, we have not pursued this further. That is the first paragraph, end of quote. In other words, there are problems and somebody needs to do a broader systems-based audit. Then the next paragraph in the report says, and I quote, the external audit and e and y, uh, the external audit that E and Y perform does include tests of the post office's IT and finance control environment, but the audit scope and materi materiality mean that E and I, that e and, e and Y would not give a specific opinion on the systems for this. So you can read the tensions here. Next paragraph. It is also important to be crystal clear about any review if one were commissioned. Any investigation would need to be disclosed in court. Although we would be doing the review to comfort others, any perception that post office doubts its own system would mean that all criminal prosecutions would have to be stayed. It would also beg a question for the Court of Appeal over the, over the past prosecutions and imprisonments, end of quote. That seemed to suggest that directors knew, auditors knew, even Deloitte, if they were acting as consultants, perhaps they knew something was going on. So the least we can say is that Ernst and Young were aware of the problems. So how were they able to satisfy themselves that internal controls and resulting accounting records were sound, enough to enable them to issue unqualified audit opinions? So what happened to these monies that the stressed, distressed sub-postmasters handed over to the post office? It ran into millions, but where did the money end up? Now in 2015, there was a forensic report commissioned by the post office itself, by a firm known as Second Sight, which is a firm of forensic accountants. They first issued an interim report in 2013. The 2015 report was never fully finalized for various reasons, but nevertheless, extract is important. That, docu that, 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 docu that report shows that the money secured from sub so postmasters sat in a suspense account. And we all know what suspense accounts mean. That means you're not quite sure what it is about, what to do with it. So eventually, the monies from the suspense accounts got uh, transferred to the profit and loss account and influenced the bottom line and executive pay. So the monies were there and nobody knew what to do with them. And they sat in there for quite a long, long time. Now, the post office accounts until 2018 do not show any contingent liabilities uh, for, uh, uh, for, for the possible compensation which may have to be paid. 
should those provisions have been made? After all, many people were claiming innocence. There was a lot of press coverage. Parliamentary inquiries had begun. MPs had become involved way back in 2015 and earlier. But there was nothing about these uh, things. So no doubt in due course, there will need to be an inquiry into accounting and auditing. I have already called for one in the House of Lords and I will be pushing for further uh, uh, on this. So to come back to the themes of the conference, you can't have a good future for any profession if you are if you're not open. You can't have a good future if regulators don't investigate. You can't have a good future if we don't learn lessons from the past. So we need to learn lessons. We also need to note that technology is not flawless. Many people think technology is going to really take over. Technology will have effect, but technology will not be a substitute for human assessment, human judgment. Yes, some jobs may disappear, but somebody will still have to interpret the data. Somebody will still have to analyze the data. And this is what the post office scandal actually shows. 